Hi, this is George Fairbanks. This is a brief overview of using contracts when you write code. By the end, you'll have a good idea about what a contract is, how to write a contract, and why contracts can help you write better code. Here's an example of a contract. However, it's phrased informally. We'll improve on that a little later. A contract states each party's obligation. In this one, the buyer must provide money and the seller must provide a sandwich. A contract is a part of your design. You can alter your design, so you can alter your contract. A contract can cover more cases or fewer. Those are just different designs. You might wonder, do better contracts cover more cases? Not necessarily. Writing a contract doesn't mean you have to cover all the cases. You may leave some details open so the implementer has more choices. Or you may nail down every possible input and output. Again, it's your design, so it's your choice. You might be thinking, I already know how buying a sandwich works. I don't need to write that contract. You're right. We all have an idea in our head about how it works. That's an implicit contract. It's in your head, but it's not written down. The problem is other people can't see your thoughts. So implicit contracts lead to unpleasant surprises. I've seen contracts like each of these in real life. Most places give you change, but I've been unpleasantly surprised when a vending machine did not. You can use contracts to avoid unpleasant surprises. The contract doesn't decide what your design is. A contract doesn't force you to design in a certain way. Once you have chosen a design, the contract reveals it so others can see it too. Looking at the contract, you may decide you like it or decide you're going to choose a different design. Take, for example, the Monopoly game. It has a rule. Pass go and collect $200. When you design software, you decide the rules. Contracts aren't right or wrong. They are just the rules that you chose. A well-written contract helps both parties, the callers and the implementers. The callers see their obligation and what they get in return. That way, they can stop guessing about what the method does. They don't have the temptation to just read all the implementations to see exactly how it's implemented. And they can stop writing defensive code just in case. Implementers have the freedom to redesign just as long as the contract is upheld. So far, we've been too casual with the phrasing of our contract. It's been using an action verb, give. It's time to change that. Let's write a contract that's easy to think about using logic. As it turns out, it's easier to think about contracts using logic than it is using procedures. So to improve this contract, we need to decide what must be true before and after. We can think about that logically. So in this case, does the buyer have $5 or not? Does the seller have $5 or not? And does the buyer have a sandwich or not? Here's a tip. To keep thinking logically instead of procedurally, try using the verbs is and has when you phrase your contracts. This works most of the time, and it's super easy to convert that over to logic. The caller of a contractor is responsible for the precondition. The precondition is what is true before. Here, the precondition is that the buyer has the money. The implementer of the contract is responsible for the post condition. Here, the post condition is that the seller has the money and the buyer has the sandwich. Legal contracts have a reputation. They're long and confusing. You might be worried that programming contracts will be long and confusing also and that might sound like a bad thing to you. In fact, the best contracts are short and simple. Let's take a look. Here's a simple contract. This is a perfectly good contract, and notice that it's tiny. Both the caller and the implementer know their obligations. I wanna draw your attention to the IFF in the middle. That's shorthand for if and only if. This contract says it's going to return true if the list has no elements, but it doesn't say what it's going to do if the list has elements. Your logic might tell you the answer, but using IFF removes all doubt. Before today, you've seen contracts and simple data types like list and stack. That's the example you just saw. You may not have seen them in your own code or on custom data types, but as it turns out, contracts work great on custom data types, just like they do on primitive ones. Here's some code, for example, uh, that might be found in a dentist office. The contract tells the caller when make appointment will succeed. 
In this case, it's going to succeed if the schedule for the dentist is free at that time. It also says how to detect failure, how to, that is, how the caller can detect failure, which is that make appointment will return null if the appointment scheduling fails. For simple contracts, you can skip labeling the precondition and postcondition. Many methods have no preconditions. That means the callers have no obligations, and they should feel free to pass anything into the method, and the uh, implementer will just uh, satisfy the post condition. Basic data types, like lists and stacks, have super clean interfaces. Callers know exactly how they work. And what's more, implementers can build them in different ways without breaking the callers. Contracts can bring that same simplicity and clarity to your custom data types. So those were some examples that I made up. Let's take a look at some real code. It's an example from the C standard library. You might have even used it before. The comment here says that the source and destination memory must not overlap. That's a precondition, so the caller is responsible for that. Notice that this procedure also has a post condition, but it's not phrased logically. It's phrased with an action verb, copies. That tells us what the implementation does. It doesn't tell us what must be true when it's finished. As an exercise, Try to phrase this post condition as a logical test. Here's a hint. Ask yourself at the end, what must be equal to what if this is a reasonable implementation of memcopy? Let's return to the sandwich example. When you think about contracts, you design better code and your code becomes easier to use. Why is that? Because as you design, you are seeking simplicity. Nobody wants a confusing legal contract in your code. The thing that you fear the verbose comments, is exactly what drives you to find simplicity. If you write a contract that's confusing, you're going to look at that and say, that's not what I want. That's not the kind of code I want to design. When your contracts are short and to the point, you know your design is on the right track. Conversely, if it's hard to write the contract, it's going to be hard to understand and use the code. I'm telling you about contracts because they will make you a stronger software developer. They change your thinking, actions, and values. As you internalize the contract metaphor, you'll look at software differently. You'll apply logic to source code, not just animated in your head. You will write contracts in your code, so both you and your team benefit. You will reward clean code and design, not short-term hacking. Contractual thinking applies to any programming language, so you can use it with C, Java, Python, Haskell, or anything else. Really, it's a transformation that takes time and effort, but the investment is worth it. Here are some references in case you want to take a look at more.